Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this it brings me enormous pleasure to introduce uh, Lars and Arthur. Um, they're two old pals of mine from Germany, and when I first interviewed them, I interviewed them in German, and at the time I said, you know what, it'd be great if you came to Scotland, and they both said, ah, oh, our English isn't very good, and we can't really do it in English, and... I kind of waited and then I figured that Vic told me that he'd been in Hamburg and you'd done a bus tour in English. And I was like, it can't be that bad then. So I find out that actually both of you speak far better English than many of the people I know in the German music business who sit on panels all the time. So you'll have to come back and do some for us next year. But Audio Elite is their label. As Lars mentioned, um, he first encountered me jumping around to one of his bands at about two in the morning in, in Holland. And um, I didn't even realize that he was, I actually own three of their songs. I didn't even realize that was the band I was dancing to, but I'd, I'd bought some of their downloads. And, um, Audio Leap for me is um, a really interesting label, not just because they put out some great music, but also because um, in the year that the German recorded music business recorded its, <laughs> its worst figures um, in history, relatively speaking, um, these guys decided to set up a label. And um, it just goes to show you can, if you take a different approach, you can also be successful. So. Lars, how did this happen? You're 2004, you, you decide you're going to set up a label. What prompted this decision? If I only knew. Um, uh, I guess it, uh, it goes way back in the day when I was a teenager and I didn't go to church and uh, told my dad I'm not going there uh, because for the money, like all my other colleagues did, you know, you go to... Uh, for a year you go to church, you know, and then in the end you uh, get uh, loads of money. This uh, is like confirmation when you're 13 or 14 yeah. in Lutheran countries, when you get confirmed, all your relatives give you tons of cash. So, uh, yeah, I told my dad, like, I, I'm not going there, you know, like nobody believes in the shit and that they're saying there. They just uh, want the money to do whatever with that. And so... Um, my dad, he's an old, uh, he's, um, my mom is a teacher, my dad is a teacher, my dad plays in rock and roll bands. So he said like, okay, you're not getting any money, I buy you an electric guitar and uh, one year of uh, guitar lessons. Uh, so with, um, about the time when I was 14, I started my own punk band, my first punk band. And uh, I was growing up in a little tiny village in the north of Germany. And um, with that band, we, play, we released records too, played some shows in Germany, this and that, and I grew up. and. Uh, grew more into this uh, like hardcore punk uh, scenery and um, the do-it-yourself scenery and uh, in the late 90s I was on a couch hopping trip in uh, the USA of Santa Barbara, uh, San Francisco and I met a bunch of people uh, from the USA hardcore community and I uh, did get to know a guy called Stevie Oki and worked for his label for a little bit uh, just importing his records uh, that he was leasing uh, around that time to Germany. And in 2003, um, his label became so big, so I just started my own label, Audiolit Records, uh, because uh, I knew how to press records and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I mean, it's not that hard to do, actually. And I guess everybody can do it, just send a master tape to the pressing plant. Uh, so I just started like um, releasing the music of my friends that I grew up with. Uh, people were like sick of bands traveling in big vans, have to pay loads of money, all the guitars, equipment, bass, big bass amps, like drums and all this kind of stuff. So they, around that time, loads of the people just starting producing music with computers, like just plug the guitar into the laptops and stuff like that. and. So I'm coming from like a more left-wing, anti-racial, anti-social, uh, anti-whatever. Uh, anti, uh, <laughs> so more of a like a do-it-yourself uh, background. My like race, anti-fascist. Always my my aunts uh, gave me like records when I was ten, like Queen or like for example Tonsteine Share. My first uh, concert was when I was twelve, AC/DC and all this kind of stuff. So I'm coming from a background uh, that's not. I'm going to like some university and studying music business. I've never read a book about anything, what I'm doing right now. I just like doing, like do it yourself basically. So what was the first record you put out? 
I did put out, it's a band called The Dance Inc. It was a, a long time friend of mine. He went to the USA too and came back with a, a song he made over there. And I was like, yeah, there's cool stuff. Just like, let's release it, just do it. Um, we sent it off to the pressing plant and a couple of weeks later we got the, the seven inch. We did, the, it was a seven inch of a 500 press. We did cut out the covers by ourselves. And the next day was the release day, and uh, we made a little party. And still, I have, I guess, hundreds of singles of them <laughs> sitting in my office. So, um, yeah. So that, um, I guess, you didn't make any money on that first release. I mean, did you? What prompted you to do another one? Um, just, just the love of music, music uh, how pathetic it, it uh, seems, but there was uh, just so much music of my friends around that I thought uh, needs uh, like to be like documented on, uh, on, a, on a vinyl or a CD or stuff like that. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's how the name Audiolith, or Audiolead as I call it, came up around that time too. It's just like a document of friends uh, putting on some kind of format. and. Uh, that's yeah. It's Maybe really he's a bit crazy too. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So do you have like a cellar with loads of unsold seven inches in it, or uh, did you get to the point where the labels start to take off and people start to pay attention to what you are doing? Basically, the label took off uh, like around 2006 or five when I did meet Arthur Shock on a Russian train toilet. Then because uh, like two. Please elaborate, so Alan. <laughs> Uh, Alan was really quite obsessed with your toilet uh, tales. So here's here's another one. Um, you you meet in a in a toilet on a Russian train. Yeah, kinda. Yeah, because we were there for smoking. Mm -hmm. We sit in the in the cab and then we went smoking together. And it was next to the toilet there, and uh, or we had to to go to the toilet because it's not allowed to smoke in the train. Um, and then we started to talk. I think so. This. And w what did you what did you start discussing? Was, how, what led how, you on to working together? <laughs> we basically discussed um, if we're going to get out of Russia alive. Basically, <laughs> how to get uh, more beer. This was the problem because the shop and the train was closed, and our beer was over. And there are still many kilometers to St. Petersburg, but it uh, wasn't possible to sleep because the train was so full. And then we decided to buy beer from the. From the train lady, or train from lady, yeah. yeah, it was like like uh, illi 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 uh, illegal market, like <laughs> and she sell. <laughs> and we bought it all. Beer. Yeah. yeah, because um, I mean the thing was that there was this uh, kind of it's called micmusic.net. It's this community of eight bit people who should have like loads of headquarters around the world. And uh, one of or two of our bands, Egotronic and Plimo, around that time they shared their sounds on that platform, and. Uh, some guys in Russia were aware of that sound and uh, emailed the bands here, blah, 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 you want to come over and stuff like that. And they're like, yeah, uh, somebody from Russia, like, uh, ask us. And it's like, okay, how are we going to do it? And we kind of like, we all arranged it together and Arthur was over there with us uh, for like translating purposes. Yeah, I, I was born in, in Russia because of this. Maybe my English is, I'm the one with the not so good English because I uh, came to Germany and had to learn German in school and after that I was so bored that I quit school and never learned English so uh, so long. But uh, because of this I had to go to uh, with the band Egotronic and Playmo. They asked me because they're a friend of mine like, to join them in Russia like, for to make translation as a translator. And because of the, that I met uh, Lars there who come with them as the label guy and then we first time met in, in Moscow and go in this train. So that's a true story but it's very funny. <laughs> And so you, you did you join then as a booker? So how did it work? You had the you were releasing the acts, and you brought Arthur into the business to start getting gigs for the the artists. No, <laughs> I guess Arthur has a story. What what I know, what I told already about me. Arthur has the same story about like uh, being social socialized or socialized. No, it was uh, like this that. Um when Lars started his record label, I, I, wo I wasn't so crazy I started a record label. I started a booking company because it was, uh, you, don't have, you don't need money to, to, to put in. You just can earn money and make concerts. And it was uh, easy. I don't know why. I, because um, I always organized concerts with friends together. Um, and because of this, I know a few musicians, Egotronic, for example. Um, and my parents uh, were 
lived in Bavaria and there I grew up. And when I was 18, I go away from Bavaria because Bavaria is very conservative and very restricted. And I go to West Germany with some friends to a small town called Bielefeld. And in the small town, there is a big university and there is a big, uh, like a squad or something, or it was a squad 30 years ago. And now it's like a cultural center or something. And you can organize concerts there in groups. And so we started to organize many, many concerts. And um, with, I don't know, Polish crust bands or something on Mondays or Tuesdays uh, every every week. And uh, there I learned this, uh, how to, I don't know, how what, what, what is a concert, how is to organize a concert. And then Egotronic asked me, hey, do you like to make the booking for us? For us, it is too complicated. It's always so, so um, it's not cool when you're the artist and write directly to the promoter because then uh, it's it's not so good to be sometimes hard or something and talking about the money and it's good if someone else can do this for so us. So you want a bastard, yeah? Yeah. Excellent. That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> and so this, you're working with Egotronic then and how did you guys, uh, after your toilet meeting, uh, come to come to sort of uh, formalize your relationship? Can't remember. Uh, like uh, we are now on for like 11 years, like when Audit was born and I think we somehow we joined forces without even talking about it. I mean, Art and I, we are just like, we combine our, uh, I don't know, craziness or something without even talking about it. We have like st sometimes the same thoughts about stuff. Sometimes we argue about shit. And it just happened that we, at one point, we decided, okay, okay, if we do all this crazy stuff and uh, we get fucked by taxes, police, or other kind of uh, instruments, artists, then, <laughs> artists we have to uh, kind of uh, get in some, somehow like ensure that we are not personally fucked. So we made this company and uh, put some money down and uh, now like a couple of years later we have uh, five people working for Audiolite uh, as there is um, like a booking department, I run the, la the label and a publishing agency too and we do merchandise mainly for ourselves, for the label and for the artists too. So uh, yeah, kind of... So at which point did you realize that this was actually turning from a hobby into something you could earn your living from? Uh, people told us we have a brand and like Audiolid, you know, it's like, okay, when there's a band from Audiolid or the label, there's uh, like uh, something with an attitude and we're like, what the fuck is a brand, you know, and then we decided to uh, go against the brand actually and made these t-shirts called Fuck Audiolid, for example. Yeah, I remember seeing that and I thought it said, because uh, it was quite, it went around quite a lot, I thought it said Fuck Audi. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we hate cars. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And so you you've got the you got it this this brand or the you know the, the although you don't want to be a brand but it grows so is this after two or three years or which point well, did actually it start like to uh, we made this company in to, uh, 2011 we made a uh, before 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 that I think it's like uh, 2007 like telling for me it's like I'm um, like when I. Uh, got out of school, the first thing I did was working three and a half years putting alarm systems and telephone systems together and then I said fuck it, that's not, I'm going not to do, got, I'm not doing this for the rest of my life. Then I went for some uh, like civil service in Germany and then I did a training to become a social educator and uh, when I started the label I was working 30 hours a week for a guy in a wheelchair and put some money into the, the money I earned, put into the label. And 2007, I decided to go like just for the label and did ask for some money from the state. There's, uh, you can like make this business plan, like here, blah, blah, blah. We're going to release lack records and uh, talk about Russian <laughs> toilets. No, that's what, and all this kind of stuff. So I got some money from the state. And uh, before that, I was working from my, uh, living room where I lived with my girlfriend and then I moved into my first office that was like 18 meter square kind of room and yeah. I think it's the, the point was that the artists get bigger and bigger and when they are bigger you have to work more for them or they maybe, okay they're all our friends but there is a market too and maybe they can go somewhere else and I don't know and we, we like to, to work with them together and we like what we do so we try to grow with the artists and when the artists like Frittenbude, when you saw them first time they were really small and now they are a very very big festival band in Germany who play really big stages with 20,000 people in front of the stage and 
So it is uh, an, another style of work, and you have to to have more skills, and, and I don't know to to deal with all the stuff. And uh, so we have to yeah to to change for sure. So in these early days where you had no money, you're doing it all in a really quite a guerrilla style. How did you get awareness? How did people find out about the label? What created this uh, buzz about it? Uh, just basically get on everybody's nerves. Just like uh, go to the record stores and like give them uh, the the seven inches we pressed, and then you go like th three months later, you go there with your little tiny thing saying, "Okay, I gave you five records uh, three months ago. Are they sold or not?" And they give you back six, for example, <laughs> and they look like shit. And uh, yeah, you have to like be uh, all over the place, I guess, and talk to people and ask people. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's. What audio makes special is that it's not just about the music. For sure, music is important. We all love music and all this stuff. But it's always more. It's more like this big social thing behind it. Like when we organize concerts, we not organize them because we were so fanatic about this Polish crust bands. But uh, for us, it was cool to hang out together and to to make a concert together. And so it's. I think this is the point. And so out of this. There are many ideas for, I don't know, for maybe films or funny actions or all the stuff uh, that we also do. It's not just uh, not just a normal record company. And I think, yeah, we'll show some, I think one or two uh, of your your clips in a bit because uh, that's something that I think is really interesting, um, especially because we just had the, uh, the YouTube talk. But... Um, before that, I mean, I was, uh, what, what's a Polish, what's it a Polish crust band? From Poland, crust band from Poland. Well, yeah. That's like a crust band, punk, punk crust band from oh, Poland. Oh, like crusties. Yeah, like hardcore punk, like right, you know, okay. quarter, quarter punk from yeah, Poland. Yeah, yeah, okay. Very, um, very great. There are ma many bands from Poland who do this music. Very interesting. Ah, and uh, <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, and the um, when you start out with the press, I mean, I, I remember some kind of story years ago that when I, I spoke to you, you, you took was it a a lot of the artists on tour and then some journalists or how did you, what was your kind of early approach to your, your press work? Um, this was in 2010. Uh, we had released uh, three releases of uh, like every month a release of like Bratze, Egotronic and Frittenbude. And I was on a vacation with my girlfriend on the East Sea and I woke up in the middle of the night and called Arthur and told him, hey, what do you think about we put all those three bands in a big bus and get our 20 skinhead friends with us and like drive, drive to the countryside and play to the kids uh, in, not in the big cities, like just in the small villages to s just support them and, uh, so, uh, and get all the journalists on there, you know, so they can like check out the everyday life of an artist uh, being uh, treated really good by, uh, the, by the label and so on. So yeah, you, uh, I called him and I said, yeah, it's a perfect idea, let's do it. And so I, I had this inspiration from uh, like the Sex Pistols being on tour in the USA when they were on tour with this just regular bus. And I think there's this movie called Another State of Mind when Social Distortion and some other band Youth Brigade, I guess, they were on tour in the USA t for like three months or something or two months. And uh, yeah, just uh, and it worked out pretty well because uh, we just uh, enforced the journalists really to come with us. And Arthur always says like, and after like two days, they had this Stockholm syndrome going on. <laughs> Stockholm syndrome, <laughs> because well, they'd gone like native, yeah. Yeah, because we told them like well, that it's cool, and uh, they they really thought it's cool, but uh, yeah, it's really um, it was not that easy actually because uh, uh, you know the oh no wow, for six I days. Know, the, the problem is that music journalists are very. Um, what's the English word? Lazy, they're very lazy. They don't like to go, they're always in these big cities or the most of them live in Berlin. They are always go to the concerts, they, on, they want always on the guest list and go there and see a band, get free drinks from the promoter and then go away, go to the next concerts and we uh, were fucked up about this and thought maybe it's cool to don't play Berlin, Hamburg and, and Munich, let's go to the sh smallest fucked up clubs we find and then we go to like it was one one small village like Tannheim Egelsee there were just four houses I think and this one club it was a, a satanic grufty club before and then someone buy it a grufty is a golf golf yeah. yeah and now it's just a uh, Bavarian guy who always smoked pot I don't know there are rats running around it was so shabby and um, we go everywhere with this bus and these journalists and 
the other uh, small village was um, I don't know. There were so long names, uh, it's, uh, and all around like 5,000 people. I think was the biggest one. And this was the, the the idea to bring the journalist out of the of their normal normal scene where where they always are, of, uh, out of the normal normal environment, and um, go with them to there where this where it happens. Yeah, where you it know, happens. Yeah. The everyday life of an artist, like where, where yeah. the kids are. Yeah, where the, the kids. Uh, and how did the what was the coverage like? Did you get a lot of good press out of that? We got Arte with us. They went on like three days. Really? They went us, and uh, we got on Arte tracks. I don't have it over here, probably. Arte is a big cultural TV channel. The, uh, the it's German and French, isn't it? Um, and I remember you telling me something about not having money to do a hire a PR company. So, what was it? You sent fifty euro notes to different editors, or what? What was that? Yeah. So we. Uh, we always thought, you know, probably those uh, like the press, to the journalists, every day they get a CD with a piece of paper saying this is the best band, blah, 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 please write about it. So we got this idea that we get, I think we did get a 10, 10 journalists or like radio stations, the Bild Zeitung, for example, and uh, we made That's this. like the sun. Yeah, it's, uh, we were the only one who uh, checked this joke. The sun. So we we made this little video where Arthur and the, uh, tells me something. I write it down in the computer, and then we go to the bank and get 500 euros out of the bank and put it in, in envelopes, and send it to to the to the journalist saying like, hey, would be nice if in the mean, in the next time when you hear about us, blah blah blah, have a nice day, buy a bottle of wine for this 50 euro and all this kind of stuff, and. Uh, it was pretty funny, like some of them, they, the build side that was uh, laughing about it, they wrote us back like saying, okay, when we, uh, as the, we want to do a CD, we're going to do it with audio lead and all this kind of stuff. But some of them were really like, oh, I, uh, you, our, lawyer our lawyers you. will yeah. come <laughs> back, like blah, blah, blah. This is because they like, I mean, it's, it's obviously people pay money to get uh, some like writings about bands done. I mean, or like get the cover of a magazine or stuff like that. And they always tell it's like, oh, yeah, we really pick what we like and stuff like that. It's, I mean, so you, you what was the, the, did the Bild Zeitung reply and say they couldn't res, uh, accept the money because yeah, they, they, added, they, they sent it back because of um, journalistic integrity? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is really on the same level as the sun or the news of the world as it used to be. Uh, journalistic integrity is not what you'd necessarily associate with that newspaper. So did the others keep the 50 euros? Oh, some guy kept the 50 euros and uh, it was a story that he got drunk in Munich with the other promoter we hired uh, uh, later on and she's like, oh, I still have this 50 euros lying around me, let's get drunk. So, <laughs> so it was fun. Um, it helped kind of because um, the the people when we put the video online they were just like what the fuck are these guys doing and it's like it's just fun you know it's like not taking anything to everything too seriously and like, well, you know I'm interested with the videos because the when I I don't know if I get on it here but the um, when I um, when I look at your YouTube channel I mean you a, a low number of views is a few few hundred thousand for you isn't it um and yeah, i mean so. some of them are over a million now Wh how um how did you manage that was it not it was it not impossible to get stuff on youtube in germany for a while because uh, of all the gamer things or oh, no we have uh, i think we installed our youtube channel 2006 the gamer and youtube thing is a uh, like different story i guess but uh, we had never had problems with so that. you could get all your stuff out yeah. there and and how did you how do you get these huge number of views have you got f a massive subscriber base or does there some way that you the stupid you, ideas right just um, we had this band called super shirt and they were done with uh, with their touring so we t told them hey why don't we uh, give your car away for free <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, made this video where we uh, go to the super short guys and tell them, ah, oh, you guys are done touring, you are big artists now, you don't need your, your car. It was a Hyundai car and we bought it off really him. Cheap. Really yeah. cheap car. So we, <laughs> this perfect story too. And then, then we made this video when Arthur uh, rode this car from Berlin to Hamburg, it's like 280 kilometers, and um, stuck the key to the car or then something, something like in the middle 
of nowhere stuck it underneath this thing and uh, we posted this video and the people should find where it is and the first guy or the first person who gets this key and delivers it at my office in, in Hamburg gets the car for free. And then the people started going crazy and like uh, when they watched this video and they like drove their cars like on the parking lots between Hamburg and Germany and found this key and this guy, one, one guy came and we gave him a car for free. <laughs> What's this one with the lost tapes here with Egotronic? Um, I mean, is, that, uh, is this the one where you're, you're sneaking around the garden? Yeah, this is, uh, we try to, okay, Egotronic, they have to do something new, like a new album and stuff like that. Yeah, I don't know, we have to So just watch it first. Dass wir dieses Jahr noch irgendwas rausbringen. Von, von wem? wem? Von wem? Weiß ich nicht von wem. Keine Ahnung. Irgendein Künstler. Ich habe gehört, Thorsun. Thorsun hat halt die ganzen alten Songs von ihm noch. Von früher. Aber die gibt er nicht raus. Er meint, dass er das lieber selber machen will. Ja, irgendwie über Internet irgendwas. Er meint er so eine Internet? Plattform, über so eine Plattform will. So this is artist saying, yeah, Torsten, he's got some new songs, but he doesn't want to give them to us. He's got some sort of ideas of putting them out via the internet. So what happens? Do you have to kind of sneak into his caravan? Is that what happens next? Yeah, what find a label, man. Man braucht für zwei kein Label, hat er gesagt. Aber ich denke, wir müssen auch das nicht mit ihm diskutieren. Ich würde sagen, wir holen uns die einfach, weil im Endeffekt stehen die uns zu. Wir haben lange genug, haben wir ihn irgendwie äh, mit, mit durch den Dreck gezogen. Wo wohnt er? Ich glaube, der wohnt äh, in so einem Einfamilienhaus. Da, am anderen Ende vom Bauernhof. Wo? So. So. Weil ich, Nummer, ich, Name und Adresse. Er wohnt auch hier auf dem Bauernhof, wo wir sind. Aber da hinten äh, in so einem the kleinen Haus mit äh, So you're speculating on where he lives. And then, and then Let's go. Yeah. <lacht> So how many, this has had like a, uh, this has had a lot of views, hasn't it? Watch it, watch it to the end. Right. So basically, this is a guy. This is a guy who has the songs. He's not really living there, but could have been before we started working with him. Also, wusste Scheiße, wusste die Scheiße. Was ist das für Das ist drogenabhängig. Echt noch? Oh, ganz gut. Das ist da. Was? Das? Das? Das. Ich hab, er hat's. Er hat's. Geil. Ja. 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 Wir werden es rausbringen. He makes the world go round. La, 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 la. Die ganzen alten Egotronic Hits auf einer Kassette. Auf der schwarzen Vinyl-Kassette. Egotronic CD. Stuff like that. So that's, uh, go and check out the uh, check out their YouTube channel because there, there is some really funny stuff on there. And I mean, I, I've subscribed to it and the, it seems like every week or two there's something new coming through. Is that part of your, you know, is that, would you say, a really integral part of how you promote the label and um, push the label through the video content? Basically, this is the only thing we do. We, right. we tell everybody we work really hard for all the thing we do. Just sit around and think of this stupid stuff. Yeah, uh, fair enough to say, 
we want to do more stuff like that, but we have to really work too, you know, get stuff done that the artists are uh, doing well and stuff like that. But this, uh, I guess, the part of audit where we as a label are creative and uh, if this is going to die because we have to, do, um, to work more, then I think we have to change something, you know. Uh, it's our creativity that we live with these videos or whatever we do. So, I mean, in terms of the the overall business, you said you've you've got booking, you've got the label merchandise and the the publishing. How does it break down? Is the one part that brings in the most cash and the other booking things? always booking? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, I always say then when people ask this, we don't know because we don't have any analyzed tools tools where we just press on the button and say, okay, we spend this money on this uh, artist and this came in and blah, blah, blah. We try to pay our artists for like licenses every half year, booking when they are done with the invoices and stuff like that. So uh, we, I guess we are pretty, uh, you know, on, on time with our yeah, money. Even even if, if you can, our Steuerberater then maybe can put it like this, but it won't say anything because it's not about, it's not separate. You can see it separated because it's all together. So it's uh, okay. Yeah, I'm just thinking. You know, if anyone's got a label here, then if they're thinking, okay, I, I'm just putting out um, CDs at the moment. What else could I do to, to generate awareness, or what other things could help me support the artists? Because I, I know there's one or two people in the room that that are doing. Uh, they invest all the money back into the label. Mm -hmm. But if there's other ways they could be making more money, invest more, then obviously it's quite a an attractive proposition. Um, we make money, but we lose money too, I guess. And it takes like some, for some artists, uh, we spend like three years of like releasing their records and nothing comes back. But it has uh, uh, one time on these uh, days, I'm going to say buzz. But um, then, you know, it comes back when the, when the artist plays more and like uh, gets more money for playing live and uh, yeah it's, it's I mean, you mentioned earlier on the the you know artists have to talk to people and if you're you know you have to be out there as well um do you do you find that something that you happens naturally or do you tend to gravitate towards those sorts of artists or do you discuss it with them beforehand before you start working together um i think I'm not saying that like all the artists we work uh, with are really the coolest people on earth, you know, but I guess we have some kind of uh, agreement on what we think is uh, cool to go to talk to people, like be with people, you know, just be a gentle, if somebody's an asshole to you, be an asshole to them too, you know, and just... Uh, uh, if uh, just if you approach somebody nice, just I think it's the first. Be positive uh, in the first place, you know, and um, because you always meet twice, three times uh, in lifetime. Hopefully, maybe, maybe more. But um, that's it, basically. Just be positive. But have you had any? Um, have you had any acts that you've stopped working with? Yes. Um, one for like one band uh, they're called the Dada Jung Polyform. Uh, when I started working with them, I really liked the music and I released the record. But within half a year, nothing really. Uh, their show, that like they were on stage, nothing evolved. You know, there was uh, it's always a problem. You know, the sound is bad, the light is bad. Too less, uh, just uh, to uh, to less people, blah blah blah. And I was like, uh, it's not the it's not the the surroundings, what are the problems? The band is the problem because they don't evolve, they don't think about how they could do it better, you know? They're, and uh, I, s I told him, you know, like, I don't want to work with you any longer because uh, you're not evolving, you don't, it's always, the problems are always somewhere else, you know? And I told them and uh, like half a year later, the band split up because um, they released a record and like another label did the record and uh, they they told the label, yeah, we, w we don't want to play live. I was like, <laughs> Why don't you even make a record then, you know? It's, uh, I mean, you can, but... Yeah, I think we still learn a lot uh, from every day's doing. It's not like we have, a, a, I don't know, an idea or something like an ideology or a philosophy or something that is so close. I think we'll be learning by doing it. When we started, we don't know anything, and now we know a bit more, but we're still learning and learning, and that's, that's uh, the same for our artists. Some are uh, more, I don't know, more... It's easier to do good videos, to have good ideas. Other are uh, maybe have now other things. It's, uh, it's very different. 
Um, I think we've not got much time, so has uh, anyone got any questions um, for, you know, two guys doing something um, in Germany? Maybe there's some, some advice or some ideas that have been sparked off here. Anyone want to ask? I think there's a microphone floating around somewhere as well. So, Diana, did I see you raising your hand there or are you just scratching your chin? Can you uh, think, you can think while the microphone makes its way over to you. Hello. Um, so well, you, I think your videos are great and I actually want to go make some funny videos because I hate pomposity and I like it when people are tongue in cheek and bring some hilarity. Um, you know, there was a guy yesterday with an amazing app that takes loads of camera angles and sort of mashes it into one edit presumably you don't need incredibly expensive equipment to start doing some things that are quite amusing and can get on you know what kind of gear did he use would he say it's possible to do things with a good phone or one decent camera and a phone or i think um uh, the the technique uh, i mean you could we can like spend twenty thousand euros on something that looks bad or like uh use something with a uh, cheap equipment and it, it turns out bad too. I think the first uh, thing is the idea, and then there's there will then will there a way will be found to do it, you know. And ask around, you know. That always people are uh, like, if the idea is good, you know, people are willing to just put in much effort in it, and not just think about okay, what kind of technique, uh, like which camera, blah blah blah, we are going to use. I mean, most of this stuff is just. Uh, done with this uh, cheap as cameras we got uh, when we were around in like 2005 now we bought this camera for like 700 euros and uh, with this guy who's interested in doing uh, like video cut things he just does it and because he's he loves it to do you know it's just, uh, I, I'm, I personally I don't have any clue about it you know but I guess um, we are always encouraging people to like do what they like and like just keep on con continuing work, believing and that they can evolve, you know, and maybe uh, somehow it ends up in years that they're going to make a living out of it. And it's not like the music is like for video guys too. We had this one guy who shot our, one of the first videos and he's now like loads of, uh, he just made a good job, you know, wasn't, didn't cost a lot of money, but uh, the ideas were good, you know, and now he's uh, getting paid quite okay for like doing videos for other bands, you know, so... Um, so, um, how do you see the label uh, developing? Um, I mean, are you, have you got any plans for the next year or two? Are there any th new things that you'd like to do? Uh, the more people we get to, to work at Audit, the, the more kind of stressful it is to get the structure right, so everybody's not uh, uh, fighting each other, you know, working on the same, you know, this is this, this is... Uh, to get the structure going on, that's probably the... the thing we are focusing on and for sure you know it's uh that we want to everybody stay stay healthy for sure you know and then uh, and creatively are there any things that you you'd still like to do uh my i, I want to do a film but i think it will never happen but i think maybe. we should <laughs> make the time um, ladies and gentlemen um, i'd like to uh, to put your hands together for Lars and Arthur from uh, Audi Elite. Thanks very much for coming, guys. Now, thanks, Olaf, for having us over. Really a pleasure. Fun. And thanks for you guys being here. That's really cool.